Cool. So, hello everyone, and uh, welcome to Sivo Meetup. Uh, so, Sivo is a cloud hosting company. Uh, we have a managed Kubernetes offering based on K3S, and uh, uh, we'll be talking about that as well. Uh, so, this is the Sivo Meetup. We kind of do these regularly, so you can check out the past recordings on our YouTube channel. And this particular session is uh, focused more on the Kubernetes dashboards that I'll be talking about. So I'll be talking about various Kubernetes dashboards that I like and um, that I would like to explain as well. And today I'm joined by uh, Adolfo uh, from Portainer and he'll be talking about the uh, latest CAS integration uh, with, that lets you spin up the SIBO Kubernetes from within Portainer. Uh, big fan of Portainer. Uh, I have been, you know, a um, long time user of Portainer as well. So it's it's always, uh, you know, uh, fun to use it. And uh, so, yeah, let's get started. Um, so my today's topic would be various Kubernetes dashboards. A bit about myself, I've already told. Uh, these are some of the places you can follow me, uh, Twitter, YouTube, uh, join Discord and stuff like that. Cool. So when, we talk about Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a complex system. So we all agree on that. And Kubernetes has a level of uh, difficulty where people, especially the developers, they do not want to kind of interact with Kubernetes and they want to kind of keep developing their applications. Uh, now, Kubernetes dashboards can be of two varieties. Uh, one can be that gets installed onto your Kubernetes clusters. One can be that you are installing a client and then you are connecting your cluster via the kubeconfig file. So there are two varieties that you can use it. So when you talk about uh, the use cases, there are various use cases. Uh, Kubernetes dashboard gives you an overview of the clusters and its workloads. That's the first and foremost thing that Kubernetes dashboard gives. It actually gives you the uh, visualization of your cluster. So um, it's helpful for the SRE, it's helpful for the DevOps engineer, it's helpful for the dev uh, developers who wants to get a view of what is actually happening and running in their Kubernetes clusters. Now, on the other side, uh, when you talk about the client side stuff, uh, then also these benefits obviously are the same, but the developers, like they are developing the app, they do not even have to install, uh, you know, uh, anything fancy onto the cluster, do not run any kubectl command, and they can just upload the kubecon file or the token given by their team as a secret or whatever, and then they can uh, get going. And most of the times it, uh, like, not all the tools, but some of the tools that I'll be discussing today does provide the ability to edit stuff as well. Like uh, you have pods, deployments, replica set, and so on and so forth, all the objects that are deployed onto your cluster. So uh, that's where all the dashboards come in with different, different flavors of different functionalities that they provide. That's where they differ. So like one dashboard will be giving you the, uh, you know, out of the box OIDC um, authentication. One dashboard would be giving you the plugin support. So like this, there are different, different uh, dashboards that give you kind of different features. So it's up to then you to decide uh, as per your use case, like what do you want to use it for? So yeah, it gives you the overview. Then it is helpful for troubleshooting. Yes, um, from the dashboard itself, you'll be able to see all the things. So you don't need to kind of, uh, you know, go to your CLI uh, and have your kubes and run your kubectl commands and, you know, uh, get all the things step by step. So these dashboards give you the, the workloads with all the necessary information that is actually required to do the first level of troubleshooting. Obviously, increase developer productivity because you don't have to kind of learn uh, a lot of Kubernetes, a lot of kubectl commands. You can kind of skip that and you will be able to directly use these dashboards because uh, when people kind of rely on these, especially, uh, uh, you know, at my time working in the machine learning projects, the machine learning engineers, they, they wanted to see the pods, logs, uh, describe, but they don't want you know, to go into that, like, you know, having the uh, kubeconfig variable set, the kubeconfig file that keeps on rotating, uh, then all that stuff. So they have a dashboard, that's it. And, you know, just do that. Uh, then managing cluster resources. So uh, that's what it does. So the first one that I want to talk about is Octant. Uh, so Octant is a kind of um, 
Kubernetes, it gives you the Kubernetes dashboard view in, in the client side of things. And you can have a resource viewer. So it, there's a lot of things. Like it gives you the web UI instantly. So it's a binary. So you download the Octant binary. So it's a binary that you download and it immediately exposes the web-based UI for that locally. Uh, now it gives you one interesting thing is the relationship of the objects, which no other gives as smoothly as it does. So it, it it has a resource viewer. So we'll see all these as well. Just want to quickly skim through the, uh, you know, all the features of these, but we'll definitely go through them as well. Then it gives you the summary view, summary of the workloads. Uh, you can actually do a port forward, like you create a pod service, and then you can directly do a port forward instead of the typing the command, kubectl port forward and so on and so forth. Uh, so you can directly do with a button click. Logs in exec, yeah, they are definitely there and they should be there. Uh, then the label, label filter. So this is great when you have like thousands of objects in the namespace, you can filter them by labels and you can have your own labels. Uh, then you it will be easy for you to uh, do the segregation. Uh, plugins, this is very, very interesting feature in Octant. So there are different plugins that people have developed and you can develop as well. So that Octant has a plugin support and I have given two examples like they have a Helm plugin, they have a Starboard plugin. Uh, so Starboard is for security scanning, Helm is for like what all Helm stuff is installed on your cluster. So if you download plain Octant and run Octant and you see, you you won't be seeing the Helm and Starboard, Starboard over there. But there's a directory like, uh, you know, home slash config slash Octant and you uh, in the plugin folder, you uh, download that plugin tar file and put the plugin over there, then you will be able to have those plugins. So I think that is uh, pretty neat. Next one is Schooner. Schooner is uh, a CNC of Sandbox, I believe. So it's a CNC of Sandbox project. It um, The most interesting feature of Schooner is that it has live metrics, like fast and live metrics. It's very fast, lightweight, responsive UI. What that means is in it has a very good mobile view as well. So if you, uh, if you are viewing Schooner in, in your mobile, then also it will give you the you know uh, the very good responsiveness in the mobile asset. No other uh, dashboard would give you that level of responsiveness. Uh, this particular thing is like server side, uh, meaning that it is installed onto your cluster. Like you do kubectl apply onto that cluster, and then this will be installed. Uh, it has the open ID connect available out of the box, so that is some native integration, which is very cool. The next is Headlamp. Um, headlamp is by uh, Ken Volk. Uh, so it is also in cluster, but it also has a desktop version. So you have like kind of both. Um, basic Kubernetes UI, which will be there. And again, it, it has a plugin support, which is uh, which you can customize the UI as per uh, you. Like you don't have to maintain the fork of the repository and do it. So you can actually create plugins and customize stuff according to yourself. That is Pretty interesting about this. Again, open ID connect available. Uh, clean UI. Um, uh, clean UI. It's it looks good. <laughs> so it's clean UI. Lens very famous and uh, Lens is a desktop application. It's to be honest, it's heavy, but it provides you then with those features as well. like it, it gives you heavy features. It gives you a lot and lot of features that you can do with Lens. Like multi cluster management is super easy with Lens, like you can have the, like you have the Slack, uh, you know, different Slack channels. So you can have different uh, different uh, views of the clusters, like different clusters as as those boxes, which I'll show you. Uh, it has login with, with Google, Lens ID and all that stuff. Um, Lens can help you install the metrics. So all the others doesn't have the out of the box metrics installation. But when you talk about Lens, they will let you install like Prometheus operator, cube state metrics, node, uh, daemon set um, using Lens itself onto the cluster. Uh, it also provides like a kind of free and paid pay as you go dev clusters where you can have your dev clusters within Lens itself for easy troubleshooting and all that stuff. So yeah that's pretty much about the theory to be honest and let's move to the demos so i have all the demos ready for you except for this one which i can i think i have somewhere the token for this let me grab the token
Okay. I'm going to say now's a good chance to ask Sam any questions. Uh, if there is anything uh, so far you wanted to ask about, otherwise uh, just pop them into the Q&A section and uh, we'll get to those at the end of the talks. Yep, just pop your questions and I'll, I'll let you know. Uh, so this is Kubernetes dashboard, uh, which I haven't talked in the slides, but that is by Kubernetes. So this is in the Kubernetes repository. This is the base dashboard, which is there. Uh, you, again, this is in cluster. So you have to do a kubectl apply for this to get deployed. So you can see I have, I have deployed that somewhere here. So yeah, you can see the kubectl apply, the dashboard created. Uh, it has a cluster IP service. You can have a node port and do that. You can have a ingress on top of that, but, but not. Uh, but I have just uh, created another user and token. So it's a token-based authentication or the kube config file. Uh, token is the kind of safer, safer thing because you can generate tokens. And it gives you this workload, CPU usage, um, memory usage. These are coming from the metric server. And by default, when you launch a CVO Kubernetes cluster, so all the clusters that I'm showing you are CVO Kubernetes, they are all different clusters. Uh, so when you launch a CVO Kubernetes cluster, you get metric server out of the box, um, like with the default creation of CVO Kubernetes. And from there, this metrics is coming. So it gives you all the view of your, uh, you know, daemon sets, deployments. You can choose the namespaces from here. Uh, you can have, I don't know why this, memory usage is uh you know <laughs> wobbling like this but anyways so you have the pods uh which are there so you can click on the pod then you go it's other details like it's cpu memory metadata and resource information um then the conditions if there are any controlled by which replica set and the uh events whatever is there so it will tell you all the stuff even the security context similarly for services it tells you uh, what all services are there. You can click on the service. You can edit the service. It gives you the YAML and it also gives you the JSON view that you can edit and update. Um, I don't think it has a port forward out of the box, but you can definitely go and see the logs. Um, that's very good. And you can see, let's go back. And you can also see the, where are the pods? Yeah, so that's kind of pretty much logs and describe. Yeah, so you can do that and you can edit from here as well. So you can edit a resource, clicking on the edit button, pretty simple. I think that gives you the exec into the pod. So it gives you a terminal, a shell in the metrics, which is bash or sh. This one is not because it's throwing some kind of error. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. You can also set the settings of the refresh time, how much time it should be refreshed and all that stuff uh, by default, which namespace should be there. And that's a basic view of Kubernetes dashboard. Uh, moving to Octant. Uh, so this is Octant and uh, its dashboard is also like, you can filter by labels, labels that I was telling you. So like I have uh, the applications. Uh, so this is the overview. So this tells you like deployments in a particular namespace. So you can see I'm right now in the dev namespace. So I'm here, I can see the pods, replica set, config map, secret, service account, event. So that's a kind of summary view. Then I go to the workloads. I can again see the overview and then I go to deployments. And now if I click on the deployment, I'll be able to see some of the views like summary, metadata, resource viewer now this is where i was telling you it gets interesting because that's uh that's the connection that is showed like deployment this deployment is connected to this replica set this replica set has created this pod and that is uh connected to this service account so you can see all these uh things which are there so let's if you if we kind of click on the pod you can see the pod over here and actually this green icon is clickable that uh you know that that's something like you might not know but this green little icon you can go to pods from here also but you can go to pods from this green little icon as well. It takes you to the pod and this has a bit uh, more detailed stuff. Like it tells you the, apart from the resource viewer, it gives you the YAML file that you can edit. It gives you the logs. Uh, it gives you the terminal inside the container. Now this vulnerabilities. Now, if you install, so this is the LS inside the exec. Now, if you install Octant right now out of the box, you won't see this vulnerabilities over there because this is the plugin, the starboard plugin that I have installed. And you also will not see these icons like Helm. Uh, you will not see this Helm because this is the plugin that I have installed. So you won't be able to see this. 
then uh, in the cluster overview you can also see you know uh, the port forwards and uh, you can actually i think we if we go to our resources and services and in maybe in all namespace let's go to maybe cube system if we have any yeah if we have the services over here we can uh, click on that we can do a start port forward so that's where you can do a start port forward on any of the uh, node so and you can again do a stop port forward so that is pretty handy i'll i'll do a port forward demo in lens then uh yeah that's that's pretty much it that you can do uh i think it yeah you can also apply the yaml file yeah so that's octant now let's move to schooner so this is schooner and uh, it gives you the kind of fluid like ui and i let me see if i have schooner here as well cluster yeah it, i don't know if you are able to see me so if you see me you can see the schooner is is fluid when you are uh, talking the mobile mobile view as well so it gives you a good uh, mobile view um so yeah that's that that's the ui it gives you the workloads um it when you click on workloads it again tells you what all workloads are there what all events are there uh the pods and and stuff um the i have raised the issue with the, the apply so like if i if i do like api version v1 i think i can view the docs as well uh let me see and kind pod it should give me some docs yeah so it, it gives you the docs so like api version if it is what it is uh kind uh what does you mean by kind in the spec section what all things you can um apply so i think it's not a very very big feature but yeah it's helpful for learning so if you, it, it gives you the docs kind of stuff as well and yeah you can again filter by namespace I think uh, the cluster it it doesn't help you with the multi cluster management so you have to have like schooner for each of the thing uh multi cluster management is very easily done by lens so this is lens and you can see i already have one and two clusters so this is one cluster this is two cluster and it's very easy to add more clusters so let's go to one of the clusters uh so this is a cluster and it gives you a very fancy view so now this is I told you it's heavy but it gives you very very uh, rich features as well so it gives you like cpu usage request with good graphs uh, when you go to node it gives you the node uh, memory cpu version age health all that stuff uh, it gives you the workload overview if anything is down not down all that stuff again pods you can go inside a pod and you, you can see on the right hand side its view its memory a network file system and on the top right if you see you can immediately get a pod shell so if you see you'll get a pod shell and again if i click here you can edit it on the fly and you can see you can edit it pretty pretty easily and then you can also get the pod logs so you can see it's pretty neat so it's, it gives you all the all the stuff you can delete edit and this is the um, all the other information like summary view cpu memory memory file system uh, what are the volumes if any attached what are the events if any are there and then again same with the deployments deployment will lead to uh, like you know what all things are there is it available uh, what all replicas are there in that and what all pods are there and within this also you can redirect you can go to the pod view so from deployment you can again switch back to the uh, pod view on the on the right main window which is there then again with the daemon set and same you can have it uh, so it has the networks as well like uh, the services and stuff so what we'll do is let's create a pod because i want to show you the port forwarding thing because that's that's pretty neat so kubectl run, run nginx hyphen hyphen image nginx pod is created kubectl expose nginx uh sorry pod nginx code 80 
and it is exposed to here we'll see somewhere in the next yeah here it is so now i click on this service and i can see the port forward here so i click on forward it says directly listen to any random port on local host and open it in browser i click on start it will automatically open uh, the browser and welcome to nginx so that's how simple it is and it will keep on running it you can stop um, as well so you can stop and remove the port forward it will stop doing that and you get a complete terminal over here so you don't have to switch to your max terminal or whatever uh, machine you are using within the lens application itself so you stay over here you can do all the kubectl you know uh, all the run all the kubectl get uh, nodes command like again if you want to do that uh, rest of the things like you will already have like services endpoints ingress network policies port forwarding you can have from the above service you can keep that fluid um, a workflow over there access control it gives you like list of all the access control crd view it also gives you the custom resource definition so you can see all the custom resource definitions that are deployed onto the cluster and yeah uh, it's, it's pretty neat and it also gives you like complete events too like what all events have been there so you can have the events uh by namespace by you know by all the other um what you call filters storage classes you, you have CO volume which always be be there and then persistent volume there's nothing i believe so so there'll be nothing okay then switching between the clusters so this is one cluster this is the another cluster i go over here i can see and interact with its own cluster so i think that's pretty neat and it automatically loads your cube config file so these are the clusters that i added manually uh from cube config but if you just you know install lens uh you will get the complete out of the box um cube, whatever clusters are there context are there in your cube config file they'll automatically be captured and loaded um and you can see that i believe so if we go to the settings if we go to the settings we can actually see the account no not here I, uh, preferences sorry so you can see um in kubernetes from which directory it will take all the stuff so you can see this particular thing is taking from this what i'll sync i want to do and all that stuff tell it uh, even the terminal which terminal i want to use so i think there are small small features but yeah it is feature rich like there are lots and lots of features in uh, in lens that's why it's heavy so what what all we have covered schooner what is left yeah headlamp is left so the last one is headlamp uh like i told you i i like this the kind of minimalistic ui uh with with all the things we can actually add um you know the deployment and stuff from here as well so this is and it also provides documentation but somehow it is not loading so which is fine and it gives you the uh, cluster view cluster usage again same kind of information a different view which is there and it has the plugin system as well that you can uh, develop so it has a plugin support and you can switch between your views from here itself like the dark mode and light mode whatever is there and you here you can go to the services you can again the same kind of things will be there so that's why in the slides i mentioned some of the differences between each of them so that you know uh how and where in which particular use case you can do this particular use case you can customize it using your plugins you don't have to maintain a fork uh in schooner you uh you have different set of features which are there which are not there like oidc native support and all that stuff lens again is desktop application so that's changed the whole scene and the multi-cluster management it's very easy uh again kubernetes dashboard is is regular fairly simplistic so you can use that if you like and yeah that's kind of pretty much it that um i had uh probably yeah i can share one more thing just a second just a second let me cube ctl config yeah uh, let me share again just one last thing so uh there is another tool which i haven't mentioned in my talk description like i, I would discuss but there's another which is k9s so you can have k9s that's actually a cli uh kind of thing so it's it's a cli kind of thing which is there and uh, you know um i can switch um here i can search for uh, like deployment and it will give me the deployment obviously it's not there in uh the 
default namespace but if I, if I click on um zero then obviously it will be all namespace so this is more of a cli kind of so who are the cli fans they can you know have all these um things and you can like press enter go inside press enter go inside and uh, you know uh, have logs and all that stuff so that's what canines is so again it's a desktop base so it's a cli that you install you press k9 s set the cube config and you'll be able to um view your cluster information from the cli so canines is also very popular in the developer community um now two other which i haven't discussed uh, so portainer also gives you the dashboard uh portainer also gives you like you know all the views all the fancy stuff but i'm not covering portainer because we have uh you know adolfo where he will be covering portainer so that's why i have skipped that um so there are tools that gives you more power than the dashboard so these are just the plain kubernetes dashboards but there are heavy lifting tools mm -hmm. like rancher portainer that gives you the dashboard plus on top of that additional functionalities launching clusters and all those stuff which you cannot do from these uh uis and dashboards so i hope you got a gist of kubernetes dashboards why they are important what are some of the kubernetes dashboards available open source that you can actually use and see which one fits uh to your eyes and you know your needs lovely thank you lovely Simon. that's that's that was amazing thank you so much i mean i've used some of those dashboards but i, I hadn't i didn't have yet the whole spectrum uh, of knowledge of so many dashboards that you can use with kubernetes that that was amazing thank you for that thank you right and um i suppose it's now my turn to start to talk oh about yes absolutely. <laughs> over to you over to you adolfo for oh, over to me. <laughs> oh my god now i have the responsibility of carrying on uh, science amazing presentation and um well thank you again once more I'm Adolfo Di Lorenzo from Portainer. I'm a sales manager engineer, and I'm um, more of a straight to the demo type of guy. I, I don't usually use PowerPoint much. So let me just bring up my screen and start presenting right away um, our amazing integration between Portainer and Civil. Um, so for those who haven't yet had the chance to uh, know what Portainer is. Portainer is a container um, platform platform management uh, tool, meaning Portainer was developed to manage containerized applications, basically. What don't we do? We do not manage infrastructure, meaning we do not um, spin up from bare metal, and this is important, from bare metal Kubernetes clusters. We do, though, now have an amazing integration that allows us to spin up containers using CAS. And today I'm going to show you how to do that with Civil, how to set up your environment to start using um, Civil to spin up a Kubernetes cluster directly from Portainer and how to manage these Kubernetes clusters within Portainer. Right. So I already have one here that I set up. Um, just for the sake of time, but I will show you how to do it um, step by step. So the first thing you want to do, if you have um, Portainer already installed, if you do not, please do deploy Portainer. Um, it's very, for those who would like to know, it's very easy, Portainer.io. And also we have a freemium version of Portainer that gives you full access to the business edition that is required to use the CAS functionality, which allows you to have five nodes free. So with this, you can spin up a five nodes cluster. So you just go into Portainer, download your uh, five nodes license, install the Portainer business edition. And then as um, some people like to say, Bob is your uncle. Now you can start using Portainer to deploy uh, Kubernetes clusters. But specifically today, we're gonna concentrate on the amazing capabilities of, of um, the civil Kubernetes um, uh, cluster. And here I already have a civil cloud deployed. Basically what you need to do is once you have your civil account, you go under your settings, profile, security, get your token, just this token here, back to Portainer, 
and add these credentials to your civil um, uh, account. Doing that, I'm going to delete this. I'm gonna do it from scratch. So you can see, I'm gonna delete this um, provider here. Delete this one also and start from scratch. There we, as you can see, we support several um, cloud providers, but today civil is our star. So it's basically giving the credential a name, adding your API token, and there you go. Now I am ready to start spinning up Kubernetes clusters from Portainer using the civil cloud infrastructure. Um, so let's start, any questions? Let me just make sure everybody understood that. No, easy, right? Good, cool. So now let's add a civil um, a Kubernetes cluster, lovely. All I have to do is go into environments, add an environment, go to CAS. The first one is obviously civil already. It's already got my credentials. It's going to connect to the civil platform. I'm gonna give this, um, Portainer, Portainer 2, because I already have Portainer 1. And here I have all the um, requirements to sit to uh, spin up a Kubernetes cluster very quickly with Civil. I can select the region, the type of node. And here we have all the possibilities that Civil provides in terms of nodes, node sizes, or better said, for your um, Kubernetes cluster. I'm going to select a small one, or a small one for now um the amount of nodes that i want the network i um actually created a separate network let me know the cluster details here i select i created a uh, specific network called portainer it should show up here let's see did i or didn't i uh, manage networks um yes i have a portainer network let me just Refresh that. Maybe it's the location. Well, we can always use default for now. You can select the Kubernetes version and provision your environment. It's that easy. It's that easy. It's, it has, I mean, it's a matter of seconds to deploy a cluster using civil within the civil interface it's also extremely fast i mean the advantage here is that i'm already connected to the civil cloud and i will be able to connect to this uh, cluster directly um here i'm provisioning the portainer um cluster as you can see it's creating the cast cluster if i go into my civil account i will see under my kubernetes the same cluster being provisioned very soon it'll show up here da -da -da -dum. Just give it some time. And very soon we're gonna see the second portainer cluster being provisioned. This is the first one that I have already created. As you can see, these are the nodes. Can you check in which region you, you created? Because that is the London one that you are seeing. Oh, that's right. Sorry, I was looking for the, I uh, created the first one in Frankfurt, I think. Yep. Let's go to Frankfurt. There you go. Portainer two is here being deployed lovely um so port and portainer one was in london right or new york london yes yeah. london. maybe the network also ready. will come in the london one perfect right so um here portainer one was already deployed here you see the nodes if i go into this portainer one cluster which i am in already here as you can see if i go to cluster I will see those same nodes. There you go, exactly the same nodes, those same three nodes. Right, so it's that easy. Create your civil account. If you add a, your credit card information, you get some um, credits uh, for you to test and play around with civil. It's an amazing platform. What I really like about the civil platform is it's how straightforward and how easy it is to set up um, in environments, compute nodes, it's extremely fast and easy, and it performs very, very well. 
Um, and our integration makes it even easier to use because you, now you can connect to your Kubernetes cluster directly with Importainer. So what's going to happen with this cluster once it's finished um, deploying is I'm gonna, it's going to show up in this list of clusters right here, as this one, as you can see, is already running. Okay, um, any questions for now? Because now I'm going to start showing how to use a portainer on the civil Kubernetes cluster. Lovely. Now, um, in terms of management, what do we do? Uh, again, portainer is not an infrastructure management um, tool for Kubernetes. It's a container management tool for Kubernetes and other orchestration platforms like Docker, like Nomad, and even Podman. But what we do in terms of infrastructure is touch what is basic for the deployment of containers. And that is, in our view, um, networking. So you can um, activate external balancers, ingress controllers. Uh, I haven't deployed Nginx yet on this cluster, but if I can pre-provision it if I want. Um, I'll show you in a minute to put change window means. I can restrict access to the default namespace for standard users, and you will see that in a minute what this is, but it's an important security feature. Um, I can remove the overcommit capabilities of Kubernetes and restrict uh, the amount of resources I want to enable to this Kubernetes cluster, meaning I have ensured 20% of, of resources to this Kubernetes, now only cluster and only 80% is available for any type of deployment. This is interesting to make sure that your Kubernetes can, cluster can run smoothly and in a healthy manner in case an application or a pod goes rogue and starts using up all your resources. You'll have 20% insured or whatever number you want to give it. It can be 50%, it can be 10%, I mean, whatever you want. Um, then connecting to the metrics, the API, the metric server, I deployed it um, manually. And I'll show you how I did that because it's an, also an interesting feature of Portainer. And a basic management of your storage attached to your Kubernetes cluster. In this case, I'm using the default civil volume um, to manage and deploy um, applications that need um, persistence onto my Kubernetes cluster. With that said, any questions? As you can see, this is basic to the management of containers. I'm not really doing more in-depth um, management of the infrastructure. Uh, I'm basically doing what is required to run uh, containers in a healthy manner. No questions? Okay, great. I can also attach registries to this cluster. Basically, this goes across um, not only the, just this cluster, but any other in orchest orchestration uh, platform that Portainer is managing, meaning other Kubernetes clusters, Docker, Docker Swarm. But here, the interesting thing about this is that I can add all these technologies in terms of registry engines and even a custom one if I have one. In this case, I have this, for instance, registry oe74.net, which not only I can attach to Portainer, but also I can manage volumes and images in here. Sorry, images in, in, in here, and I can go ahead, re-tag them, add new versions, delete these images. So this is quite interesting. And you will see why this is important also very, very soon. So in terms of cluster management, this is what we have. Um, and now I'm going to go into deploying um, applications on the civil Kubernetes cluster with Portainer. I see there's a question. Let's see, what is that? Okay, what is the difference between infrastructure management and container management? Does infrastructure to cluster as, as, yes, exactly. That's exactly as you um, saw it, um, Ayish. I, I hope I, I pronounced your name properly, Ayish. Um, yes, so Lens, you can do, for, as an example that uh, Cyan showed, you can do more in-depth infrastructure management of your Kubernetes cluster. With Portainer, you cannot do that. You just touch what is necessary to do uh, container management. And I'll show you now when I deploy a container, 
uh, or an application, what does that mean? Thank you for your question. Lovely. Now, um, is there's another question. Hey, Adolf, I want to ask how pertain is useful when it comes to container management, any key features? You're going to see this right now, my friend. So um, now, what do we usually want to do in terms of application or pod uh, deployment with Kubernetes? You want to make sure you have your namespaces um, defined to be able to deploy applications. You do not want to use the default one unless you know what you're doing because the default namespace cannot be restricted and you cannot put guardrails, you cannot, it's basically open and it will use whatever resources you have available in your Kubernetes cluster. So if you wanna deploy, let's say um, anything in Portainer, you wanna make sure you organize your deployments in namespaces. So I'm gonna create one called Portainer one, for instance. And with Portainer, the interesting thing here is I can limit resources into this cluster. I can define for this namespace, resource limits, load balancer quotas, registries. For instance, this one, I can enable quota storage quotas. So I want to make sure that this namespace doesn't use more than 30 gigabytes. Um, what else do I need to do here? I think that's pretty much it. Oh, I have to set at least one limit for this. For this, um, I'll leave it unlimited for now and create the namespace. You notice that I didn't allow load balancers and you would ask, but why? Um, there's a reason why we have quota for load balancers also because load balancers um, have a, a cost. So you wanna make sure with your cloud provider that you know how much co it costs to have load balancers enabled in, in your Kubernetes cluster. In this case, I'm going to enable two load balancers um, because if you just leave them open, you next thing you know, you might have a high bill of, uh, because of the amount of load balancers you used. For the cloud provider, it also is, is a matter of cost. So it has to be charged. It actually makes total sense that cloud providers like Civil need to charge for load balancers. So you wanna make sure you manage these properly. In this case, I'm allowing two for this namespace. I am uh, updating the namespace here. Now, I hope you noticed something. I did not write, write one single line of, line of YAML code. Everything was done using the UI. Um, and I updated the same, the same namespace here with load balancers, again, using the UI. So this is what is nice and lovely about Portainer. And this is one of the main features of Portainer. Uh, reduce the amount of coding you need to set up your environment and to bring up applications. Right, so I have a namespace here. Now I am, any questions? Oh, I, I pronounced your name correctly, Ayesh, thank you very much. Um, now, what are we going to do is deploy an application using the same form technology that we have in Portainer on these on the um, civil Kubernetes cluster. So I'm going to open the form. And as you can see, once more following the philosophy of making the deployment as fast and easy as possible, I'm going to deploy Nginx for now. Um, and here I have everything that I need to deploy this application. And I have actually some extra, um, one little extra feature that is more for those who use Docker, the, the ability to use stacks in Kubernetes. This is not, not something um, native to Kubernetes, to Kubernetes, but we can manage stacks uh, for Kubernetes within Portainer. So you can have um, the stack, let's say, uh, philosophy within Kubernetes. You can add environment variables here, as many as you need. Um, configurations that you want to attach if you've created configurations or if you've created secrets. Persistence, in this case, I'm not going to use any persistence, but if you use persistence, it can be in a stateful set or deployment, however you want. If you want to reduce the amount of resources within this namespace, within the application, you can do it here. 
In this case, I'll leave it unlimited. And if you want to use a replicated deployment or a global, global deployment, it's a daemon set, meaning this is gonna run in all the nodes. Maybe I could use uh, a daemon set. And Portainer is gonna let you know if by some chance something can go wrong, given the amount of resources that you have in your namespace. And how I'm going to publish this. In this case, I'm gonna use a load balancer. I have two available. I'll create the service. I'm gonna open, use it on port, no, port 80 on the container and port 89 on the service port. And the load balancer is gonna connect on port 89. And here I have a summary of what's gonna happen. As you saw, it didn't take me more than a minutes even, and with practice seconds. Oh, sorry, I forgot to talk about auto scaling. If you have the metric servers, server enabled on Kubernetes, you can use the metric, the auto scaling features of Kubernetes, but you have to have metric server deployed and placement rules. So if you have specific uh, placement rules based on tags, be that architecture, be that on a specific node that you want to use. Let's say you want to use, um, want to make sure you deploy this Kubernetes application on this specific node and how you want to do it, if it's mandatory or preferred. And here you will have a summary of what's going to happen. So I'm ready to deploy my application. I'll just click on deploy and there you go. So it's that easy. And um, being that Portainer is integrated with the civil uh, cloud, it's going to request that um, IP, that extra IP, and it's waiting for civil to bring back the IP that's going to be used in this load balancer for this given application. If I go back into my, there you go, I already have it. And you see how fast that was. If I go back into my Kubernetes um, dashboard in, Civil, you will you can click on it and it will show you that application that should be running here. Uh, it's installed applications. Here you go. Oh, sorry. Oh, this is the applications I installed from the marketplace. I'm sorry, my mistake. Um, but here on the cluster information, you will see the once it loads that I have two load balancers now. So finally, let's test this. Let's access this Nginx instance. And there you go, up and running. So that's how easy it is to deploy applications using um, Portainer with Civil. Very easy, very fast. And um, it, the idea is to, especially for um, development or even to set up environments as a, a systems engineer to make sure you have um, a first um, error-free or as much as possible error-free deployment because the forms are made in a way that's going to reduce any errors. Writing YAML files, if you do not have practice, and even for those that you do, that do have practice, that is uh, lengthy, it is cumulusome. If you're running or deploying large, um, uh, platforms, it, it, you really need a lot of time to go through all your YAML files and make sure every, although there are tools that help you with that, it's, it, it's lengthy. With Portainer, you reduce that amount of time considerably. Some people ask, but Adolfo, you're hiding the, the YAML. Um, no, you can access the YAML very easily here. This is the YAML that was written by Portainer to deploy this application. Um, but as you can see, writing this and using Portainer, time is a huge difference here in terms of being able to do this very quickly. So I do have access to the YAML, but it takes me much less time to do it with Portainer. Finally, I'm gonna show you, uh, for now, any questions? Everything good? Nice. There are, um, there are a couple, couple of questions. Let's see. Oh, there you go, sorry. Is there a way to assign an ACL to the load balancers or will these always be inbound from, from anywhere? Um, in terms of 
ACL for load balancers in Kubernetes with Quotainer, what we do is restrict this to the namespace. So whoever has access to this namespace as a user, and I'll show you how, I'm gonna add, oh, I have several users here. I'm going to add, oh, I had already created, created user Psy, and I'm going to assign Psy to this cluster. Um, let's see. Wait, sorry. Adding is repair effect is well up. Okay, wait, hold on. Environment. Oh, by the way, as you can see, the second cluster has already been deployed. It's up and running. That's very nice. Let's so manage access. So, da, da, da. I'm going to add a Psy to this first cluster as a standard user. And I'm going to also assign Psy to the namespace that we created on Portainer 1. So basically, in terms of ACL or RBAC, if you may, what I just did is assigned a user to a Kubernetes cluster within Portainer and assigned whatever namespace I define within that cluster to the users, right? So let me just make sure, uh, Sai, I, I remember his password properly. I'm going to redefine the password just to make sure I can log in because I forgot the password I had defined previously. Okay, now I'm gonna log in as Sai. Now, as you can see, Sai has access to this Kubernetes cluster to two actually. And here he has access to the given namespace container one. And interestingly enough, which is a feature I really like about Portainer, Sai cannot see the default namespace. He can only see the namespace that was defined to him. So this is a way, uh, um, um, the way to restrict access to those load balancers using namespaces and the RBAC functionality of Kubernetes with Portainer. I hope that answered your question, Chris. Okay, lovely. Um, hey, Alpha, can we use Portainer with Minikube? And if we don't want to use cloud providers and test Portainer? Oh yeah, definitely. You definitely can use Portainer. Portainer um, can run on any type of Kubernetes compliant, let's say CNCF Kubernetes compliant um, cluster. So uh, another thing you could do, for instance, you can bring up a compute node on, on Civo, install Minikube and run Portainer on top. Actually, Portainer is a plugin to Minikube. So if you run the plugins that are run on Minikube, you will see that Portainer is one of the plugins and you can bring up Portainer right away in that Minikube instance very easily. Let's go back into my portal here. There you go. And look at that, that Portainer 2 cluster running on Civil is here deployed, didn't take much time. And I can, one thing that is very nice about Portainer in terms of RBAC is I define RBAC once in terms of users or teams, and I can assign with only one roster of users RBAC to any of the environments that are running here. So I can say sign on Portainer 2 is an environment administrator. And if I go into roles, the, uh, my roles browser, which is something quite unique about Portainer, um, and this is very hard to do with Kubernetes, right? The ability to manage RBAC is something very hard because usually with, I mean, usually no, I mean, today without with Kubernetes, 
you have to do this per cluster. With Portainer, you do it only once in one single interface and you manage all your environments directly within Portainer with one roster of users. And here I see that Sai has access to three Kubernetes clusters. And I he see here what role he has. Portainer allows you to have five types of roles, environment, administrator, operator, help desk. They're similar in the sense that, um, especially environment administrator and help desk, they have full access to the environment, although help desk is read only. Operator has basically, he doesn't spin up containers, but he manages resources within your Kubernetes cluster. And then you have the standard user and read only user. They're the same. The difference is that the standard user spins up, can spin up containers and read only user cannot, but he'll have the same view that the standard user has in a given environment. Um, now I'm going to show you another very interesting uh, deployment of an application using our Git integration. So think of CI CD, where we have the CD um, portion of the method, CI CD methodology. We, we do not do CI, but we do CD. So I'm going to um, go into, now I'm in Portainer 2, actually. As you can see, I'm in Portainer 2. Um, same thing. I want to create a namespace. I want to think, keep things nice and tidy. Oh, but before that, I want to make sure that my cluster is properly set up because this has just been deployed. I haven't added any extra features. I want to restrict the namespace. I do not have the metric server deployed, but I'll show you how you can, we can do that. I'm going to uh, allow volumes to this um, Kubernetes cluster. A question, what is the difference between the role standard user and environment administrator? I see the same as, okay. Well, the environment administrator can manage, can do this that I'm doing here. He can go into the cluster, he can set up the cluster, he can set up registries. The standard user cannot do this. He's basically, he can only manage uh, spinning up containers. That's basically the, um, the difference. Um, okay. So I'm going to save the configuration for the second cluster that we have up and running. We're going to create a namespace. Call this Portainer 2. Keep things nice and tidy. I'll be, um, I'll give it to web balancers also. Uh, you know what? I'm not going to restrict any resources. Uh, and I'm going to leave the quotas, the storage quotas. So it's going to be slightly different. I created this namespace. And now I'm going to give Sai access. Do I already, did I give you access to the? Yes, I already did. So now I'm going to namespace. I'm going to give Sai access to this namespace here. No, I suppose I did that, didn't I? Let's see, environments, container two. So, oh, okay. Sai here is an environment administrator to this container, to this um, Kubernetes cluster. So if I go to namespaces and I try to assign them as a user, what's gonna happen is I don't need to. The reason is, and this is one of the differences, he's already an, an administrator. I only assign namespaces to, to standard users. Administrators have access to everything. So if I log in as Sai into and start working on this cluster, you will see that I, do not to need, I don't need to manage namespaces for this given Kubernetes cluster because here the user Sai can actually manage the cluster. So it, it's, he's the admin. I don't need to really assign him namespaces. He can add namespaces. He can manage namespaces. So that's one of the other differences between the administrator and the standard user. So now let's create a, let's deploy an application using Git integration. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna deploy from manifest and I'm going to use Git. I have, let's say, MySQL here. 
Uh, da, 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 deploy, where is my SQL? I have this file, which is a YAML manifest. And the way we do it very nicely and very easily is that you select your namespace, you can enforce that the um, namespaces used are the ones defined within the YAML file. Give it a name. Oh, it's already here. Head, it's deploy my SQL. And something very interesting and very nice about Portainer. And when I was saying the CD portion of the CI CD uh, philosophy is the ability to pull that repository. And if it detects any changes, redeploy those changes on, 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 onto your pods, onto your applications. So Git becomes your single source of truth. You, this is very especially important for developers. They have Git as their single source of truth, and they don't need to worry anymore once you connect Portainer to that Git repository in terms of deployment. Everything is going to be deployed automatically. So this is very nice. I set it up once, and then I can continue my development on top of my um, YAML file, and that's it. I can also use webhooks. So if on your CI pipeline, if you want to, at the end of the CI pipeline, do the deployment using a webhook, you can also do that. This will trigger the deployment once I use this link. Finally, force redeployment is a business feature where you can ensure you always have a clean, uh, brand new deployment of that environment. So um, this is spe especially interesting for situations when you need to have a temporary or ephemeral deployment of a container. And this will ensure that you have a force redeployment of a clean, and usually you, the timing won't be five minutes, right? Unless there's a good reason for that. But let's say 24 hours. Every 24 hours, you want to refresh that deployment. You click on force redeployment, and on the following day, it's going to have come up clean. Um, so, which I'm not going to set because it's not the case here. So again, very easy. I give the namespace, give it a name, point to the repository, the branch, the manifest. I can add files if I want to that are dependent on this deployment. Authentication if it's a private repo and deploy. Click on deploy. And fingers crossed, there you go. Manifest successfully deployed. So this is another method of deploying applications using Portainer onto your Kubernetes clusters. If you want to see how this deployment is going, you can click on the application name and you can click on events. There is enough memory. Um, I can go to namespaces and click on the namespace also and see whatever events are running on that namespace Similar, similar to the cube CTL get events namespace. Um, it says it doesn't have enough memory. Let me see if I can add more memory or if I restricted that. That namespace, I believe I didn't. No, I did not. Eventually at some point it will deploy the MySQL database. Memory reservation, one gigabyte. Oh, how much memory do I have in this cluster? Maybe I don't have enough memory. You know what? Here's what we can do. We can go in here and say that the memory reservation is going to be of 112 megabytes, or I don't know, 720. Or 724 and commit changes. So what's going to happen now is that Portainers are in, in, in the interval of five minutes is going to detect that change and try to redeploy that application. So I don't need to touch anymore the configuration of Portainer. It's going to do that automatically. Two more things I want to show you that are quite interesting about Portainer and Kubernetes. Let's say you're like, oh, I like this GUI. It's nice, but you know what? I really have to do something with kubectl. I really have to go into my app, my um, um, 
uh, cluster, I have to manage the cluster somehow. So let's say here I'm on Portainer 2, we have a kubectl shell. And in the kubectl shell, I can access the Kubernetes cluster and I can run kubectl uh, or Helm directly within Portainer. Uh, there you go, kubectl, get events, and Portainer 2, for instance. There you go. I see what's going on with my um, era all the events running on that namespace. The other thing, I can also run Helm if I want to deploy Helm directly from here. The other thing that we can do is export the kubeconfig. And I'm going to export, um, let's say, Portainer 1. And I can um, put it under documents. And the interesting thing about this, this uh, cube config, you will see, let me move this uh, documents side to my cube folder. Now I'm going to open, for instance, lens. Portainer now is going to act as a Kube API proxy server for that Kubernetes cluster. The interesting thing about that is that with this, with two those two features, and those are the Kube Cuddle shell and the Kube API proxy server exporting the Kube config file, I do not need to ex uh, expose any of those ports. The Kube API uh, uh, server port, I can close it. And I can close access via any type of shell, secure shell, SSH, hopper to those nodes. So this is very interesting for air-gapped, um, airtight Kubernetes clusters where you can have just Portainer managing them and you don't need to expose uh, other than the port that's going to talk to the agent on that Kubernetes cluster. And the agents that talk to the Kubernetes cluster use TLS. So it's basically a VPN between Portainer and that Kubernetes cluster. So the file we generated should be here. Let's see, uh, refresh, da, 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 da. where is Sai? Oh, here it is, Sai. So now I can access my Portainer cluster. Using um, Portainer as a Kube API proxy and it will bring the size are back profile definitions. It takes some, it takes some time. Sometimes it takes a while. And very soon we'll be able to use uh, access violence to this Kubernetes cluster. In the meantime, I want to show you also something very interesting in terms of the cube config file, which is being able to restrict the amount of time that you will have to use this um, kubeconfig file, meaning I can ex give an expiry time to this kubeconfig file. So if you need to share this to, with an external party that needs to manage your Kubernetes cluster somehow, you can determine an amount of time for it to run. It can be daily, it can be weekly. And just it's just having the management. Of, for now, it's like that. We intend to have a custom amount of time in the future. But for now, we define one day, one week, one month, one year, or no expiry. Let's go back to Lens. Let's see if it brought up the interface. Uh, it's a bit slow, but here I can see the nodes. I can see the namespaces, Portainer 1 in Portainer 1. Then I can manage the infrastructure of that Kubernetes cluster using Lens. Um, another nice trick that I also do, if you have a little bit more patience is um, run. Right, let me open a new terminal here. And let's run this. Uh, sorry, it's black, but let me minimize lens. So it's not black on black. And increase the font. So now I can run also kubectl from my terminal if I do the following. Go into my cube. Um, a folder and do a symlink of my YAML 
as a config file. And then I can run kubectl commands here where Portainer is acting as a proxy server. Now look what happened. I tried running everything and it didn't work. Why? Because the user Psy does not have admin rights. He can only run kubectl on whatever he has access to. Uh, so I can do get pod on n portainer. And this is portainer one. There you go. Right, any questions? Right. When there are no questions, it says they're very good or very bad. Okay, finally, one last trick is, as you can see, running um, the same cube config file on Visual Studio for developers. So if you have the Kubernetes plugin on Visual Studio, I can access that cube config. And via Portainer, have access to your civil cloud without having to expose that civil that Kubernetes cluster onto the internet. Okay, that was it. Any questions? Anything else? Otherwise, that's what I had to show. That looks like about it, doesn't it? I think it's still a few questions along the way, uh, but I think that's everything. Thank you so much, Adolfo, for joining us. No problem. Well, Thank you very much. You just come in. I just, uh, as Nain's saying, you explained everything really well. Thank you very much. Looking forward to using Portainer. That's great. Lovely, lovely. With Civil. With Civil, of course. Yes, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> um, so if you want to, if everybody is watching or if you've just tuned in, uh, you can catch us on our YouTube channel at Civo Cloud. You can see the playback for this. Um, I mean, is anything else left? Is there, Simon, is, you want to go over anything? Yeah, just one last thing that Portainer Community Edition is also available as a marketplace app install. Uh, so you can directly do a one click install of Portainer if you immediately want to try. Uh, we'll work with Adolfo to get the business edition as well um, listed soon. Thank okay. you. Okay, thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks, Adolfo, Thank again. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone at Portainer. We'll see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you very Bye. much.